maybe for about eight years, or nine years, I should say. This man's been in the Word of God for over 20... 1977. 1977, and I'm not a math whiz, so I'm not going to tell you. 36 years. 36 years. So if you've, if you've been pastor has a good understanding of the Word, let me tell you something. This man knows a lot more about the Bible than me. And so it's awesome to have his gift, his talent, his love, his support, his sacrifice. He was in here yesterday helping me set up the baptismal. I mean, this dude does it all, and he does it with a cheerful heart. I'm so thankful for Mike, my stepdad, a mentor of mine. Now I'm going to be his pastor. It's crazy. But everybody give a hand clap to Mike as he comes in for the word. It's a special blessing to be serving here with Jonathan, I'll tell you wouldn't be anywhere else in the world. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. You are alive. God, you are alive in us. Every born again believer in here this morning is filled with the Holy Ghost. God is alive in you. Father, we thank you that you're alive in us. We pray that the Spirit of God in us would just continue to quicken us and Holy Ghost rise up inside the heart and the mind and the spirit and the body and the soul of every believer in here this morning. Lord, challenging us causing us to stand straighter and taller, Father God. Help our eyes to be open. Help us to get a vision and a, re and a revelation of what it means to be an overcomer yes. in Jesus Christ. Father, that is the topic of our message this morning. And Lord, I'm asking you, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Jesus, come in this place. Reveal yourself as the awesome, the absolute, the only King, the only Lord of Lords, the Most High God, the God Almighty and Immortal. Reveal yourself as who you are in the life of every person. Not just who you are up in the sky or in a book somewhere, but who you are in them. Who you are in me. Who you are in us. This morning. We give you praise and honor and glory in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Give God a praise yes. if you're alive. Amen. The Bible says the dead praise not God. Yeah. Dead people don't praise God. That would be spiritually dead, physically dead. So anyway, let's get that slide up there, Jared, and get it rolling. This message is, and thank you, Pastor Jonathan, for allowing me the opportunity to minister this morning. I believe this message is going to be life-changing if you open up your heart to the Word of God. We're in a series about the end times, and the end times, folks, that's good news for us. Amen. Yeah, it's yeah. good news for us. Yeah. God wants to tell us, he wants us to know about the end times, not to scare us, but to prepare us. Yeah, he wants us to know what's coming down the pike, so we don't have to be caught off guard, so we don't have to be caught unawares, so we don't have to be deceived, as the me message was last week. I encourage you, if you weren't here, or even if you were here, go back and listen to that message again and again and again and again and again. Today's message is about the overcomers. The overcomers. Go to the next slide, please. Same one. I want you to look at that. I want you to dwell on that a minute. I want you to see that. I want you to see yourself in that picture. I want you to see yourself as that person. I want you to get a vision. I want you to look in those eyes. Let those eyes become your eyes. This is a picture of a Roman soldier. Rome, the Roman army. The most powerful army, the most efficient army, the most amazing and invisible fighting machine that ever walked the face of this earth. At their peak, at their height, they were fearless. They were ruthless. They were brutal. They were trained killers. They lived for blood. I had a friend of mine that raised some animals, fighting chickens. Anybody ever know anything about fighting chickens? He's from Kentucky, anybody or down south a little bit? No, they're not real legal, but anyway, he did it anyway. There's other animals, but there's certain breeds of these chickens. It's literally in their blood, and literally their blood starts to boil. They get in a fight, they get in an aggressive mode, and something, a switch flips on the inside of them. And they will not stop unless one of two things happen. Either they die, or their enemy dies. 
They can't stop. They get to a certain point, they can't stop. They smell the blood, they taste the blood, they, they feel, they see the blood, and it does something to them. Folks, that's what the Roman army was like. They were just trained, and the more the blood flowed, the more it rose up, it's like an excitement and a euphoria in them, and they just wanted more and more and more. What's that got to do with Jesus? I thought we were supposed to love everybody. Love, peace, joy, that's what we're about, right? Well, that's part of it. But here's another part. I want you to see yourself as an overcomer. You've got to see yourself as an overcomer. Because I'm telling you, if you're born again, the greatest overcomer this world has ever known is on the inside of all. His name is Jesus Christ. He rose up from the dead. He wasn't afraid of devils. He wasn't afraid of death. He wasn't afraid of anything. He wasn't afraid of religious teachers. He wasn't afraid of the establishment. He wasn't afraid of the Roman government. He wasn't afraid of the authority. He wasn't afraid of anything. These Roman soldiers, a little later on we'll touch a little bit about the armor of God, but Paul talked in Ephesians chapter 6 about the armor of God, but where he got his imagery and his picture and the reality of it was from the Roman soldiers, and oftentimes he was chained right next to them. He knew the Roman soldiers very well. I want you to look in that eye, if you can see those eyes. When the Roman soldier was in his arm, which was the best, his breastplate, his helmet, his sword, his shield, his shoes, everything, he looked in his eyes, he was not afraid. He was not intimidated. He was not scared. He looked in his eyes, and it says in that Ephesians chapter 6 that we might stand against the wiles of the devil, the schemes, the plans, the, the methods that the devil uses to try and take us down. That word stand against means stand against. It's like opposition. You see it today. Anybody ever watch boxing, ultimate fighting, or anything like that? You see it on the basketball field. What is it? You're steering your opponent down. You're trying to play a sight game. You're trying to get intimidate him and make him think that, hey, you got something and he can't beat you and he can't touch you. And we play that game on the streets. We play that game in school sometimes. But for the Roman soldier and for us in real life, it's not a game. This Roman soldier, when he was dressed in his armor, he feared nothing. He said, go ahead, you can make my day. He says, go ahead, look in my eyes. I am not backing down. I am not giving up. I am not giving in an inch. I was reading one of the things about the, the shoes, the boots that they wore. You know, an army, the infantry travels on its feet, right? It's boots. Well, they had their own type of shoes and boots back then. A little different from ours. But most of the things I read said on the bottom there were spikes of varying lengths. And what it was so they could dig into the ground. And when you got a whole line of these soldiers, you see they had a big rectangular shield. Most of us, we've seen the movies. We've read books and things like that. And you get a whole line of these soldiers together and they'd lock their shields together and it'd be a solid wall. And they had these big spears that would come out the front with a sharp iron tip on it. And they had these feet that would dig into the ground. And they'd take a step and they'd go an inch at a time. A little bit, a little bit, and you could hear them stomping. You could hear them coming. You could hear them moving across the field of battle. One solid wall with sharp spears pointing out with eyes like that that are burning, saying, I am not backing up. I am not giving up. I am not compromising. I am not giving an inch. I am going to take down whatever obstacle, whatever enemy comes in front of me. Folks, that's who you are if you are a Christian. I said that's who you are if you are a Christian. Amen. Amen. That's what we've got to get in us. If, when, we get that on the inside of us, that vision, that image, that picture on the inside of us, we won't be afraid of the end times. We won't be afraid of the darkness that's coming on this earth. We won't be afraid of whatever happens, but we'll be ready. We'll be overcomers. We're dressed for battle. 
You might know Rick Pino. There's a Rick Pino song, We're an Army Dressed for Battle. We're an Army Dressed for Battle. We need to learn that song to make out where you are. We're an Army Dressed for Battle, man. Because it's a powerful song. But let me tell you this. Here's learn this one. So they say, okay, what's all this stuff got to do? Your enemy is not your spouse. Your enemy is not your wife. Your enemy is not your husband. Your enemy is not your children. Your enemy is not your parents. Your enemy is not your boss. Your enemy is not your neighbor. Your enemy is not the government. It's not the Republicans. Your enemy is not the Democrats. Your enemy is not big business. Your enemy is not any of those things. We wrestle and we fight against flesh and blood. Not against flesh and blood. But against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness in this world. Against the wicked spirits that are everywhere in this world. Influencing, trying to infect and effect and affect everything we do. God wants us to see something. Go to the next slide, please. I know there's a lot of people here this morning. A lot of you, you're new. This is the odd stuff that's new to you. You're trying to figure out, excuse me, what's going on and what's happening all this stuff. If you don't remember anything, I want you to remember four things from this message. We're going to be talking about a lot of stuff. We're going to be talking about a lot of scripture. We're going to be going over a lot of ground, some of it. It'll be new to you, some of it. may go over your head, some of it may blow your mind. I don't know. But remember four things. Number one, Jesus is coming back. Jesus Christ is coming back. Number two, right before Jesus comes back, it's going to be the darkest time this world has ever seen. Number three, because of the cross, what Jesus did at the cross, everything necessary for you to make it, for you to stand, for you to be able to be victorious and more than a conqueror was done because of the cross of Jesus Christ. But the fourth thing is, you've got to stand. There's something you and I have to do. Pastor talked about it earlier this morning. You can't just expect God to come in. You can't just expect your Bible to sit on your nightstand or on the shelf and learn by osmosis. It does not work that way. You've got to get this Word of God in you. You've got to love this Word of God. The Bible says if you don't love this Word of God, you don't love Jesus. It says it's no more babes. Desire the sincere mouth of the Word that you may grow thereby. How many of you ever had a baby? How many of you ever had to tell the baby it was time to eat? No, the baby tells you it's time to eat. The baby cries. I have a question. Not right. We'll talk to you later, David. Thank you. But the baby tells you it's time to eat. I am hungry. I want to eat now. It might be 3, 2 o'clock in the morning. It doesn't matter when the baby's hungry. It tells you when to eat. It cries out for the milk, and he keeps crying. She keeps crying till you feed it. Are we like that? Are we like that with the Word of God? How many days can we go without eating? How many days can we go without drinking? And we wonder why we have problems. You say, I don't feel like an overcomer. And I can look at my Christian life and it sure hasn't been an overcoming. It's been up and down and all around and all that stuff. There's a reason. But these last days, God's warning us. He's calling us to step up. Amen. Times are changing and we need to go forward in Jesus' hands. With that, we must stand. Amen. Let's go. You know, I was thinking about these end times. And go to the next slide, Jared. I'm not sure that's it. We're going to be jumping around. Yeah, that's it. I was reading 2 Thessalonians. It just jumped out at me. And this teaching on end times, you know, it's like, oh, man, that's heavy. That's too this and all that stuff. And that's a lot of churches. They stay away from it. But this is what Paul said. And he was talking about this very thing, the return of Jesus Christ and all the stuff that's happening in the end times. He says, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And what hit me when I read that was the fact. But this was basic teaching for new believers. This wasn't, you know, Advanced Christianity 701. This is Christianity 101. He said, when I was yet with you, one of the basic things I taught you was about all the stuff that's going to happen. Why? Because I want you to be ready. Because I want you to know. I want you to know that your life's down here. You're not just floating around after you get saved waiting for Jesus to come and beat me up. You're here for a purpose. You're here. We're here for a reason. He says, I want you to know that reason. It's a high calling I've given you so you can walk in that calling. Yeah. So you can begin to lift your eyes up above just the horizons of this world. See, there's more to life than just earning a living and trying to be a good person, raise a family. Those things are good. Those things are part of God's plan. But folks, if we don't ever look and see beyond that, above that, then we'll miss it. We'll miss it. Next slide, please. 
Which one is this? Okay. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Folks, there's some tough stuff that's coming down the pipe. So why would I want to hold out? Why would I want? What if I'm persecuted? Folks, persecution is coming to the United States. It is already here. Can I say something? You are blessed to live in this country. Jonathan, how many nations have you been in? 18 nations. I haven't been to anywhere near 18, but I've been a few. I've had the privilege to be in Moscow, Russia. I've stood in the center of the city. I've been in Red Square and the Kremlin and Lenin's or, gray, or, or Marx's grave and all this other stuff. I've been in some other communist nations, former communist nations. Folks, we live in the most blessed nation on the face of this earth. And the reason it's blessed is because of the influence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus brings light. He brings life. He brings liberty. No political system, no economic system can do it. Jesus Christ does. And this nation was blessed to the degree that they endeavored to apply the biblical principles, principles of truth, principles of the Old and New Testament, and incorporate them into our civil government, into our business, into our homes, our families, and our neighborhoods. That's why we were blessed. But now we have leaders at the national level, state, local levels that are defying God. They're denying God. They're rejecting God. They're turning their backs on God. It talks about that in Romans chapter 1 about the nation or the generation before Noah, before the flood. It says they deliberately thrust God out of their mind. They didn't want to know about God. They didn't want to hear about God. They didn't want to hear about righteousness. They didn't want to hear about holiness. And guess what? God brought in judgment upon them. As it is in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days before the coming of the Son of Man. We're living in that same generation, and to the degree that our leaders, whether on a national level or whatever, turn, turn their back on God and deny God and push Him out, they say, we don't want you, God. We don't want you in our courthouse. We don't want you in our White House. We don't want you in our schools. We don't want you in our public squares. We don't want you anywhere. Guess what? We're reaping the fruit of it. And our mayor's crying out for more and more police forces. More and more. Why? Because violence. Violence. Folks, it's going to get darker. But the church needs to get lighter. The church needs to get brighter. Because the church is an overcomer. Because the church has an answer. Because the church has the truth. Amen. Because the church is ready. The church is prepared. The church is realized we're not living for ourselves anymore. We're living for Jesus and the things of God. Now, what was I talking about just before we went through this slide? Remind me. What was I talking about? Because that's not the slide I wanted to go to. You might remember? Yeah, these are basic things. These are the basic things. These are the last days in the spiritual warfare. So God, so what are the things we're supposed to overcome? What are the things we're supposed to overcome? Let's look at it. You're going to have to skip down several slides and where it gets to. Go ahead and skip through those and find the ones where it says three things that we overcome. And those three things are this. Number one, the flesh. Number two, the world. Yeah. Number three, the devil. Yeah. That's what we need to overcome. Yeah. See, there's a lot of talk in end time stuff about spiritual warfare. Because again, our, our, our war, our fight, our struggle is not with the flesh and blood. It's with the spiritual powers that are working in this world and working on us. But there's a lot of, there was, especially in the 80s and the 90s, like spiritual warfare was a big deal and everybody's taking authority on the devil and shouting at the devil and yelling at the devil and all that stuff and, and binding and loosening and all this stuff. And most of that was a bunch of hooey. Most of it was just a bunch of summer dance and pony show. And they still went around, and they turned around, and they walked out, and they still were sleeping with somebody else that they shouldn't have been sleeping with, and they were still drinking and snorting things they shouldn't have been drinking and snorting. And their lives were a mess. You know what spiritual warfare is? First thing, you've got to overcome your flesh. The main thing about spiritual warfare is crucifying your flesh. It's living a disciplined life. That's the number. What do we got to overcome? God's given us this weapon. God's given us this power. God's given us these promises. But what are these for? Is it to fight against everybody else? No. It's to get your body under control. This flesh is going to take you down. 
See, when you were born again, we're spirit, soul, body. When you got born again, 1 Thessalonians 5 something. When you got born again, your spirit was born again. Recreated in the image and likeness of God. Created in righteousness and true holiness. Your spirit on the inside. That's the part of you that's created for fellowship and communion with God. Before you and I were born again, it was dead. That means it was separated from God. You're a spirit. Whether you're born again or not, every one of us in here, basically, you're a spirit. Man, you have a soul and you're just living temporarily in the body. But you're a spirit. And that spirit gets born again when we're born again. Then your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect. That soul needs to be renewed. And to the degree that you renew that soul, it's like reprogramming your computer. To the degree that you do that, your whole package, your spirit, soul, body will be transformed. And then over here, you got your flesh. you got the body. And it's, it's the thing of flesh, and it always wants to do what the flesh wants to do. Your flesh is never satisfied. Your flesh never has enough. It always wants more and more and more and more. So you can't listen to it. And God wants us to learn how to walk in the Spirit. It's your emotions and your will and everything submitted to the Spirit of God. Get your flesh in subjection. Because, see, once your soul... Your mind, your will, your emotions, this is where you, you make your decision and your choice is here in the soul. Once that gets in line with your spirit over here, guess what? They outnumber the flesh two to one. Yeah. And the spirit's going to win. Yeah. And your soul's going to win. And your life is going to win. But if your flesh is, or your soul is over here and it sides with the flesh, guess what? You're going to go the way of the flesh. That's why you say, how can a person be a Christian and do that? How can a person be a Christian and say that? How can a person do that? How can that pastor run off with the choir director and all this other stuff? Because they weren't listening to the Spirit. Because they weren't building up their spirit. Because they, they may have had this Word of God in their head, but it was not in their heart. Because when it gets in your heart, it changes the way you believe. And when you get your way you believe, it changes. And the way you talk, it's changed. The way you walk, it's changed. The way you live, it's changed. And that's what being a Christian is. It's about being changed. Jesus didn't come and just say it's okay. He said, no, you're not okay. You need to be changed. You cannot change yourself. So I am coming to do it for you. Number four is, there's a part you and I have to play. There's a part you and I have to play, amen. Folks, this is good news, amen. amen. Hang with me, this is good news. So we got to overcome the flesh. we got to overcome the world of the devil. Let's go to the next slide, please. It's a little more detailed. It says, but put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. It's interesting. Hopefully at a future time or maybe in a small group something we'll do a study on the armor of God. But you put on the armor of God, it's putting on Jesus Christ. Yeah. Jesus is truth. Jesus is our righteousness. His yeah. breastplate righteousness. Our feet shall with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, guess what? Jesus is our peace. He is our peace and the gospel is all about Jesus Christ. We, above all, we take the shield of faith. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. Faith comes when you hear about Jesus. Put on the helmet of salvation. Jesus is our salvation, man. Yeah. And when we get the helmet of salvation, we start thinking like a saved person. Yeah. And you, a saved person is going to think like an unsaved person. Your mind gets renewed by the Guess what? Has the Bible talks about your old friends when you got saved. It said they think it's strange that you don't run with them to the same excess of partying and rioting and running around. And anybody ever experienced that? Anybody ever experienced that? Listen, if you haven't got saved, if you are saved and you haven't experienced that yet, you ain't saved enough. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm trying to help you. Anybody ever hear of GoPro? Got all the duct tape, GoPro, bailing wire, and fix on the Somebody told me the guy invented that was walking through the woods one time. I don't know if it was her or what. I mean, all the little cockle birds and the little birds, you know, they get on your legs and pant legs and stuff. You go walking through the woods if you're a hunter or whatever you might. just walking through the woods. He says, wow, that was a great idea. And he came up with the idea of Velcro. 
We got too many vocal Christians around. There's too much stuff sticking on us that shouldn't be sticking on us. We get too close to stuff and it sticks on us and we let it stay there. Well, when we get saved, that stuff stops. And it's a process. It's a process. And I don't quite understand, well, I do a little bit. Some people, some people, when they get saved, they really get saved. And other people, they kind of struggle. And maybe you're in that struggling part. This message will help you. Getting a hold of this will help you. But for every one of us, it is a process. None of us have arrived yet. None of us are there yet. It's a journey. We go from faith to faith to faith. We go from glory to glory to glory. But you got to start somewhere. And the where you start is at the cross of Jesus Christ. And what Jesus Christ did for you at that cross was enough. It was enough. It was enough to break every power of darkness, to break every bondage, every lie of the devil. And the more we see that, and the more we get that in us, we begin to look like that warrior on the left side of that screen up there. But you're going to have to build that image. See, they trained. They trained. They prepared. They got ready. They drilled. And when they weren't out in battle, when they were in their camp, they continually, when they were at their height, they drilled and they drilled and they went through. So everything was a reflex to them. They didn't have to think. They knew exactly what to do. They knew exactly how to move. They knew exactly where to go. But as Rome continued, they got lazy and they stopped doing that stuff. And they eventually fell. The early church, they drilled. Yeah. They prepared. Yeah. They lived. They knew where to go. They knew what to say. They knew where to stand. They knew what to do. But as the church got on, and as it began to be more accepted, guess what? They got lazy. Yeah. Yeah. And the world went into a thousand years of darkness yeah. because the church went into a thousand years. Praise God for revival. Amen. God has never been without his witness. God has never been without those. Even in the midst of there was those that were faithful and true to God. And so, in the midst of this, it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal mind that you, and neither yield yourselves unto God, but yield yourselves unto God. I edited that. As those that are alive from the dead and your members as weapons. King James says instrument, but it's literally, the Greek is a weapon. Of righteousness. The Roman soldier was killing sheep. The Christian filled with the Spirit of God is killing sheep. Amen. Against the devil. Amen. Against sickness. Against disease. Against depression. Against oppression. Against anything that is contrary to life. Amen. True life. Life the way God defines it. Not the way we define it. The way God defines it. And when we see that, you and I, when we begin to build in the process of building that conqueror on the inside of us, it says, but if you through the Spirit do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. We recently had to bury my stepdaughter, Donna's daughter, sister the oldest in the family. I'm convinced what took her down was a stronghold in her mind that said you'll never be free of this addiction. You'll never be free. You'll always be a this. You'll always be in bondage. No matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, you'll never be free. Folks, that was and is a lie. That 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 is to say that is to say that what Jesus did at Calvary was not enough. That Jesus fell short. That it wasn't enough. That something else had to happen. If I'm going to be free of this thing, folks, nothing could be farther from the truth. And the reason, you say, well, why am I still in this? Why am I not free? Why do I still live like this? Why do I still, Paul, is the wretched man that I am. 
Well, we need to read on where it says, I thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ that he has set me free. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. And he wrote on, goes on to say, if you through the spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. What's the problem with the body of Christ? We don't know enough how to walk in the spirit. And we argue about stupid things like what color we should paint the church. Whether women should have makeup or not makeup, pants or dresses. It's stupid. It's got nothing to do with righteousness. Righteousness is the condition of your heart so that I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ and by his grace. And when that empowers us and emboldens us, that conqueror begins to dwell in us. That conqueror begins to take shape in us. That conqueror and our eyes begin to look. And when the temptation comes, and when the lie comes, and when the deception comes, we begin to stand and we can begin to look that thing in the eye and say, I am clothed in the armor of God. I'm clothed in Jesus Christ. And I am not afraid of you. I am not going to back up. I am not going to compromise. I am not going to give in. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to run. I'm not going to flee. I'm going to fight. The ancient Spartans, they redid a movie. They had an older movie made in the 50s or 60s, about 300 Spartans. They called it 300. Have I seen that movie? I haven't seen it. It's pretty bloody. We're pretty gory. Had to sensationalize it by because we're so dull in our senses. Yeah. We keep bombarding our stupid senses oh. with lust and pornography and filth and perversion and blood. Yeah, we're a generation that's sick of blood. And it just deadens our senses till we just are numb. Yeah. Oh, tantalize me some more. Yeah. Crank it up so my brain flies out my ears. Oh. Come on. I'm trying to help you beat the devil. Yeah. Now Jesus did it. But we got to walk in. You. Every one of us in here. You got to walk in. You got to stand. When it comes down to it, you're the only one that will be standing. You can't stand on your wife. Yeah. You can't stand on your husband. Oh, can't stand on your preacher. Preachers. Bless right. God for preachers. Yeah. Matthew, bless God for people like Brett and other people. Every one of us maybe had someone in our lives that was there to help us encourage us. Bless God. But when it comes down to it, when it comes down to it, when it's your evil day, <laughs> when the enemy's there, you got to stand on what you believe. you got to stand on what you know. And i got to say this, because there's many people in here that have been hurt by a lot of things in the body of Christ. There's a scripture in Hebrews 13. And we know a, a, a church, they have a lot of close relationships in a certain church here in town, and they've had some horrible things happen in leadership. I can get to that part. But anyway... I mean, not the details, but why that happens, and don't let it shake it. <clears throat> Hebrews 13, 7, it says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken, and spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. King James, when it uses the word conversation, it means manner of life, the way you live. It's not just what you say, but your whole way you live your life. He says that, and then all of a sudden, he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I remember reading that and used to think, I mean, all of a sudden he's saying one thing and then it's like he blurts out in his Holy Ghost praise or whatever, just had a Holy Ghost moment, and then, okay, now back to my left. And I said, oh, it just seemed kind of out of place. Till one day I was in a situation in the church and things were falling apart because the leadership was falling. And God looked in that scripture to me. And I saw it wasn't out of place. It says, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. That's what leadership is supposed to do. The number one job of a spiritual leader is to speak the word of God. 
is to preach that Bible. Because without this, we are defenseless. If we don't know the truth, we won't know Jesus. And we won't recognize him when he comes. Now, when he comes, he's going to come like lightning, so we're not going to have a chance to say, oh, is that Jesus? No. <laughs> but there's going to be multitudes, many, coming in my name, saying, Pastor talked about it last week, I am Christ, I am this, and multitudes are going to run after him. Many churches out there today saying, I am the way, I'm the way, we're the way. Some of them are very exclusive, and you don't believe like us. And you get to, Folks, I'm just saying, if you don't believe on Jesus, if you don't believe like this, if you don't believe on this word, and the miracle is you can read this Bible for yourself, and you can understand it. But there's got to salt to it. That's a miracle. It ain't complicated. I didn't say it was easy, but it's not complicated. It's pretty simple. It says... You know, honor those that have to rule over you who's spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. Faith was their example of faith. Who they walked or talk. You know, considering, look at the way they live. Does the way they live line up with the way they talk? Does the way they live line up with the way they preach? And sometimes you can't see the way they live. Especially the big preachers. You have no idea how they live. Because you don't see them. And then he says, and don't ever forget, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. Forever. Preachers may fail. Churches may fail. Pastors may fail. All sorts of institutions may fail. Jesus never changed. Jesus never changed. Jesus will never change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the beginning. He is the middle. He is the end. He is the Alpha, the Omega. He is everything in between. He is Lord God Almighty. And He is the one that died for your sins. I didn't die for your sins. Jonathan didn't die for your sins. Billy Graham didn't die for your sins. The Pulchers, goodness, didn't die for your sins, I'll tell you. Jesus died for your sins. He didn't change. Some people say this in their youth group. Some people's faith in connection is with their spouse and their faith. Some people's faith is in their pastor and then the pastor falls, they fall. Why? Folks, I've seen a few things. I have not seen everything for sure, but I've seen a little bit of the good, a little bit of the bad, and a little bit of the ugly. I've been in church splits, I've been in horrible situations, but let me tell you this. None of that, none of that, none of that for a minute can you ever doubt or question my faith. Thank you, Lord. Why should it? My faith wasn't in them. My faith was in Jesus. They didn't save me. Jesus saved me. They didn't die for me. They may have failed, but Jesus never has. Never has, never will. Can't. Because he's God. He's man, he's God. I'm going to take two more services to get through this message. <laughs> okay. We're going to fast forward here. Okay, we got the flesh. Next one is the world. Gotta overcome the world, love not the world, and all the judgments in the world. Why? Because the world's going to pass away. Next one, let's go. We've got to overcome the devil. The devil. Why? Submit yourselves unto God, therefore, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Hey, that's good news. Some people don't try to resist the devil, but they haven't done the first part. You've got to submit yourself unto God. Oh, I'm resisting, I'm standing against the devil. Oh, submit yourself unto God. Oh, I'm resisting, I'm standing against the devil. Oh, yeah? Okay, do you have what? What you put in front of your eyes? What you putting in your ears? What you thinking about? What you meditating on? You got putting junk in your life, you're putting garbage in your life, you're putting perversion and filth and scum in your life. You gonna try and stand against the devil, honey, sister, baby? It ain't gonna happen. And God's warning us right now in this time. If we went back to overcoming the world, the world is bombarding us with media to try and deceive us and destroy us. And we sit back on autopilot, let the good times roll. We got our big screens. We got all that junk. Oh, we got our sports teams and we worship them. 
I'm not against sports. I'm not against that stuff. But what I am saying is, is it your God? Is it your God? What are you putting in your heart? What are you putting in your mind? What are you filling your soul with? Because what you fill your soul with is going to determine which way you go. Am I going to go the way of the spirit? Or am I going to go the way of the flesh? And if I begin to see what took our daughter down, what takes many of us down, is the strongholds that are in our mind, the imaginations, the thoughts, and all the things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and tell us, oh, it's foolishness. Oh, it's okay. Just a little bit won't hurt you. A little dab will do you, you know. One little drink, one little puff, one little pill, one little shot, one little feel, one little touch. It's okay. Folks, it's not okay. It's not okay. It's never been okay. Now, if you're in bondage and stuff, bless God, there's the grace of God. And there's the blood of God. And there's the mercy of God. Jesus was a man. And he, he was tempted in every single way. Like a man, he never sinned. But he knows what it's like to be in this flesh. He knows what it's like to have your flesh streaming out. He knows what it's like to have your mind all floating around or like a file cabinet that somebody came in and dumped everything out on the floor. And that He knows what it's like to go through that struggle and that turmoil. But in the midst of that and over above all of that, he is still a conqueror. He did what you could not do so you could have what you can never get on your own. Praise God. And that's the peace of mind and victory. Of God. It's not meat and drink, it's not rules and regulations, it's righteousness. His righteousness. It's peace, His peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Peace comes when we submit to Jesus Christ. Peace comes when we submit to Him. And as we submit to Him, we see God's power begin to move in our lives. And more and more we'll begin to see ourselves as conquerors. We'll begin to see ourselves as an overcomer. We'll begin to see ourselves the way God sees us. Not in the light of the flesh. Not in the natural light. But in the spiritual light. In the light of redemption. If you will, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Why do we talk about the blood? It's because that, the life of the flesh is in the blood. That was the price Jesus paid. That was the only price that could take care of and deal with your sin and my sin. Nothing else. That's why there's not many ways to God. That's why when Jesus said, I am the way, he meant it. There's no other way but through Jesus Christ. Security comes. Everything you're seeking comes from Jesus Christ. No other way. You'll not find it any other place. You are a spirit. That's why nothing in this world will satisfy. It's only Jesus. Only Jesus. That's all. Safe.